Tonight on CTV News, a Freedom Campus speaks out why he's all for a bylaw. A step forward to solving the problem around window washers and the country's top shop put his back on the building site. Broadcasting across Canterbury, from the CTV studio, this is First at Five. Kia ora, good evening. A Freedom Campers had enough with other Freedom Campers, saying some are disrespectful, giving the group a bad name. Chelsea Daniels has more. The proposed freedom camping bylaw hearings are now underway, but one camper wants even tighter controls on the practice to make it safer. He says one night he was hassled by youths while he was parked up, a situation that could have easily turned sour. Oh, it was just a couple of young fellows um, hassling around the truck. Warren has been freedom camping for around two decades now, coming to Christchurch to help out in the rebuild. I came two weeks after the earthquake to help out with the demolition. Warren says the council is an active partner with the Freedom Campers. The, the council have been very, very good and relaxed, you know. They've tried to help out. They haven't just come heavily handed. They've, because they realise that there is people out there that, you know, are, are working and helping out. Like me, I work seven days a week. And he makes an effort to abide by the council's guidelines. I shift every day. Whether I'm working or not, I still shift every way and go away, you know, and um, look for work if I wasn't working, but I've been working, for, you know, most of this year. He says it's a few people breaking the rules that gives all Freedom Campers a bad name. I was parked up one day where I do park up and there's people pulled up in two vans and I seen them go over to where these buildings were and when they left I walked down there and here it was, they'd done a, you know what, number two's right outside this Bob Burnett's, who was there recently, um, door. And so I rang the police and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And I think I got the colour of the van, I noticed, I know what van it is, but it would save that too as well, you know, because you've got people doing stuff like that. Submissions for the proposed bylaw began last month with strong support. The bylaw suggests banning freedom camping within the four avenues, in the main business areas of Littleton and Akaroa, and in the New Brighton North Ramp car park. It also restricts freedom camping in residential areas of the city to be certified self-sufficient vehicles and limits their stay to three nights in one location in any 30-day period. Vehicles without onboard toilet facilities will be given a restricted number of areas to park through by the law for only short periods. Anyone that doesn't comply will be slapped with a $200 fine. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. Police will now have the authority to seize windscreen washers' equipment under a new council bylaw. The Christchurch City Council voted unanimously to ban the commercial activity in public places unless the washers obtain a permit from council. Worst case scenario, a person could be fined up to $20,000 if prosecuted. Investigations are continuing into a man in his late 20s who died after being hit by a train late last night. Police were called to railway lines on Main North Road south of Kaya Point around 11pm after the train hit a pedestrian. He was found dead at the scene. The man's death has been referred to the coroner. Well, many Cantabrians joined others around the world today for International Shakeout Day, helping to raise awareness around earthquakes, with one local school showing how it's done. It's become second nature to these Christchurch students, all part of the International Shakeout Day. Make sure you're holding on. The move plate, the shaking will stop shortly. You're all safe. Waitakere Primary School joined nearly 111,000 Cantabrians rehearsing their earthquake drill, taking place at quarter past nine this morning. Since we had the major earthquakes, um, it obviously brought to a fore how important that children knew exactly what to do, so it comes natural to them. So if there is another earthquake, they will know immediately what to do and their response will be different. They have to do drop cover hold and then after that our teacher will tell us we have to go outside and we have to sit in the corner and have to read the roll and, and the kids have to be quiet. Not only have the students been practising their safety drill, they've been exposed to a three-day virtual programme providing other measures to get them prepared.
emergency plans, emergency kits. Um, what does it mean to be prepared for an earthquake when we don't know when it's going to happen? The program involves nearly 190 classrooms around the country talking how to prepare at home and school. Shakeout was hoping to attract one and a half million Kiwis to drop, cover and hold. Since the last time we did shakeout in uh, 2012, there's been a, a lot more uh, take up this time. Um, yes, more people are interested and are aware. Um, so certainly in Christchurch, we didn't have quite so many previous times because it was just after our earthquakes. Um, so it was still a bit raw for a lot of people. They say the awareness has helped since the Canterbury quakes. It was terrifying for them um, because it was new. And as for today's drill, uh, I was quite nervous that I was going to like do something wrong or like, yeah, it was just nervous. I think this shakeout event is fantastic and I think everyone should be prepared and know what to do. Because if there's a real earthquake you might not know what to do. Jared McCulloch, CGB News. Still to come, new bus routes will roll on. Welcome back. Environment Canterbury signed off on new bus routes in order to reduce congestion on the Northern Motorway. ECAN improved a new commuter bus service to the airport and Hornby, as well as increasing the frequency of some buses, altering routes to improve coverage. At present, close to 11,000 Waimakaleri residents travel to work in Christchurch daily. The Blue Line bus will see minor changes, with four additional trips being added each morning and afternoon. The new and improved services will start early to mid next year. The worst congested routes around the city have been revealed and it doesn't look like roads will run smoothly any time soon. Chelsea Daniels explains. The most clogged traffic routes in the city have been revealed, with the worst area taking drivers twice as long to travel on than it should. Oldwyn's Pages and Kerr's roads through to Wainoni Road heading to New Brighton is the slowest route in the city. The route should only take about six minutes free flow travel time, but instead takes commuters almost 12 minutes. There will always be congestion in the city. Um, it's a matter of trying to manage it to an appropriate level. And CTOC manager Ryan Cooney says they don't have enough time or resources to fix everything at once. The, the challenge is of course to find ways to optimise traffic signals, to optimise lane configurations etc but of course every one of these things takes a bit of time and, and potentially funding and we have to always prioritise our efforts. Um, we, we don't have funding and or time um, to solve all the problems in the world in one very short sharp um, um, session. But they are surveying the congestion. It's a bit of every little bit helps. Um, uh, we don't have uh, a, a, a silver bullet, as it were. Um, there is, it's a matter of continuing to put all the little pieces of effort in. He says having alternate routes around Christchurch is both a blessing and a curse. For when disaster strikes and one motorway is closed, there are always different ways around it. Christchurch is a very grid-based network. There's a lot of options, a lot of decisions that drivers can make around where they travel, cyclists, etc. Um, so what that means is that um, trying to have one very efficient route is actually a little bit difficult because we, we end up with travellers choosing to move from an alternative route onto that one. And, and he says while roadworks are a big cause, they're not the only one. It won't clear everything up, but it will have an impact. So um, in the eastern suburbs, there is a large volume of roadworks at this point in time. And as a result of that, that's where a number of the eastern suburb routes come from. Um, however, there is a large number of other routes that are just, there's simply, there's a lot of traffic. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. Nightclub co-owner Tony Tucker appears to be making a miraculous recovery from his horror car crash. Tucker was critically injured in the crash, claiming his husband Michael Burnby nearly two weeks ago. They were, stuck, uh, they were struck head on by a suspected drink driver who went the wrong way on Salisbury Street and crashed into the couple's car near Durham Street. The, uh, the bar posted an update on their Facebook page saying he's sitting up and his temperature is back to normal. The post follows by saying Tony's obviously had the angels on his side. Well now here's Warren Head with your local business roundup. Warren Head from headliner.co.nz. Well, the news came through from the dairy sector that the drop in the value of the dairy business for the country was just under $5 billion this past season. So you can see what an impact that's going to have 
carrying on at that level if that is indeed to be the case. But fortunately, we're seeing these dairy auctions picking up every time there is one, it gets better. And also what has been getting better has been the state of the government's books. This gets a bit political. At the end of the day, I don't think too many people really know what a deficit or a surplus really amounts to for them at home. But uh, that's uh, quite normal anywhere in the world. And the deficit um, has been a problem now for the last seven years, largely because of the global financial crisis. But the finance minister has come out now and said we're running at a small surplus. And he got ahead of all the critics and he simply said, well, take off your glasses, lean forward and stare a bit harder on the chart and you might see it. It was $400 million, $414 million, but it was there. He did say, however, that he wasn't taking off all the restraints. Constraints is the word he actually used. And that means, of course, that things will be not any easier in respect of Crown funding for this or for that. There won't be any loosening up. In this particular era, uh, we're now looking forward to seeing what happens in budget 2016. This is the last year he was talking about for the 414 million. The crisis developer, Mr. Castles, uh, Alistair Castles, who owns the tannery, is selling 45% of the business. He's put about $20 million into the retail establishment down there. All credit to him. Well worth a look, particularly now the good weather's in. Go take a look and do some Christmas shopping there. He will be selling off part of the business through a proportional sale in terms of units in a property syndicate. They'll be on the market by the end of the week, and I believe that investor will get about 8.5%, which is pretty attractive compared to money in the bank. There'll be 200, 350 units with $50,000 each sold. In Wellington, a law firm, Gibson Sheet, is trying to find people who have a Volkswagen that has an emission problem uh, to sign up for a class action against Volkswagen. All the vogue these days, these class actions. And in the last thing I saw coming through this morning, yes, just as the minister announced that there was a surplus, there is indeed a travel tax coming through as well. The travel industry disliked it intensely. The forestry industry said, good stuff. Uh, it'll help uh, cover all those biosecurity costs. The cost of that second sniffer dog that you'll see at your feet next time you go through the airport. I'm Warren Head for headliner.co.nz. Thanks for that, Warren. Now let's take a look at what's happening in your neighbourhood with Andrew King. Dairy's makeshift repairs after the February 2011 earthquake could be causing problems for motorists and pedestrians. Cathy's on Cranford, on the corner of Westminster and Cranford Street, put up a temporary structure to hold up part of its roof that overhangs onto the footpath. But the City Council is now investigating whether it is a safety hazard. Councillor Ali Jones said, goes past the intersection regularly and says it's definitely a problem. She says nearly five years after the earthquake, that I saw must go. The Shirley Papanui Community Board agrees and has told the council to investigate. People parking close to the intersection of St James Street and Hewood Road have forced the local community board to take action. 18 metres of no stopping lines will be painted on the intersection and extend into Hewood Road heading north to prevent people from parking there. The Shirley Papanui Community Board approved the changes in their meeting last night. The famous Edmunds Factory Garden has a brand new gate, seven months after the original was stolen. Wollstone business Hammer and Tongs made the new gate for free and it was installed yesterday. The original, which was worth just under $2,000, was stolen in March. A Nelson woman has been charged with the theft. Meanwhile, the garden has another problem. People have been drinking there during the day, getting drunk and leaving the garden in a mess. Drunk people have been visiting it during the day, leaving a mess and deterring families. The City Council is now looking at putting a drinking ban in place. Kashmir High School has been nominated for an International Sustainability Award for the second year running. The school's Sustainability Council is up for the Oceania School Award at the Zayed Future Energy Prize in Abu Dhabi. The council work the council's work has helped the school cut its electricity usage by nearly one third. It hopes to build on that with more solar panels and more education. 
The annual prize recognises individual organisations and schools who have contributed to renewable energy and sustainability. Previous winners of the categories at the event have included Al Gore and Panasonic. And finally, the Rawiti School PTA have created a Give a Little page to raise $20,000 to start repairs on its school pool. PTA co-chairperson Louise Wedlake said it is vital for children in the eastern suburbs to learn how to swim, something she says cannot be achieved in a leaky, cold pool. The pool was built in the 1940s and has leaked thousands of litres of water since the 2011 earthquakes. If you want to donate, go to the Give a Little website and search for the Rawiti pool. From the newsroom, I'm Andrew King. Thanks for that, Andrew. Still to come, Sport and your region's weather forecast. Welcome back. Canterbury Rugby is hosting their first home semi-final in two years this weekend. Gordon Finlater has more. Saturday's big matchup against Taranaki will come with extra importance after the visitors handed the Cantabs their only loss of the season three weeks ago. Oh look, it's only a few weeks ago, so it's really clear that they came down and, and did a good job on us. You know, we had opportunities to win that game and we stayed in it, and it was a fair game. And, and, and uh, seven days, so you now we've had a really good preparation, we've had a, a great week in semi-final level preparation, so we're, we're excited. Also excited is Canterbury Rugby CEO Hamish Riak. After missing out on a semi-final last year, a big crowd is expected at AMI Stadium. We're, we're about 11,500 uh, now, um, the weather forecast is fantastic, it's a late afternoon kickoff, so a good family time, still tickets available, and, and uh, but it's going to be a good crowd and, and we're looking forward to it hugely. And while he's not getting ahead of himself, Riak knows how big a provincial final would be for Canterbury Rugby. We hosted Auckland in a final I think in 2012 uh, in the first year of, of the Temporary Stadium uh, and we thoroughly enjoyed that so um, it would be nice to earn the right uh, to, to host a final but first things first uh, a very good Taranaki side coming to Christchurch for the semi-final first. Canterbury racked up their ninth win of the season last weekend when they overcame Southland by 39 points to 20. Canterbury midfielder Rob Thompson grabbed two tries on the day and is now the second top try scorer in this year's ITM Cup. After missing out on last season's Crusaders side and playing club rugby for old boys earlier in the year, it's been a life-changing 12 months. When you stand back and look at what, sort of everything and how it unfolded, you know, it's a pretty, um, pretty special story for myself and for my family. But uh, yeah, as far as those tries go, taking opportunities. And taking those opportunities has landed Thompson a lucrative Super Rugby contract, signing on for two years with the Highlanders. You know, there's a couple of opportunities there. I chose to go, go down south because... You know, the players will be around me, the coaching staff, and I, I just thought it would be a, a good move forward for me. For now, though, his and the side's attention will be focused solely on this Saturday's clash against a side they know can't be taken lightly. Any uh, Naki team you come up against is bloody tough, and uh, we know that it starts with their forward pack, and you know they do the job up front for them, so you know we've got a huge task, and we're just going to make sure we're up for it. Saturday's game kicks off at five past five, with the other finalists being decided when Auckland host Tasman tomorrow night. Gordon Findlater, CTV Sport. New Zealand's top male shot putter Tom Walsh is back in town after a successful campaign during the European summer. Gordon Findlater caught up with him. The international shot putter come part-time builder arrived home just over a month ago. This week is his first back in the gym, and after some time off, he's feeling the pinch. Yeah, I got out of bed this morning, I was like, oh, my hammies, my legs, oh, a bit sore. But uh, look, it's been good to be, get back into building. The first day back on the building side, I was chipping up concrete, so that was fun. But uh, apart from that, mate, it's good to be back in New Zealand. I was away for a long time. The almost five-month venture saw Walsh competing against the best in the world, finishing fourth at the world champs in Beijing. He then created history in Brussels, becoming the first Kiwi male to win a Diamond League event, defeating current world champion Joe Kovacs in the process. Now back home on the building site, Walsh is just a tad modest about his world-beating accomplishments. 
it's not like I'm an all black or anything like that because I'm, I'm not, you know, it's all blacks are up here in New Zealand. Um, and if I came back to the building site being an all black, I'd be, you know, a superstar of God and I'd be able to do anything. Um, where, look, they still, they, they understand kind of what I've done, but not to the full extent if that makes sense. And I don't, I don't think anyone in New Zealand, well, certain people do, but a lot of people don't in terms of until you see it, until you kind of see how, how the competition is and, and what we have to go through. Now amongst the world shot putting elite, one could ask why Walsh has the need to work while he's back in the country. I had a comp in March, I still haven't been paid for that. <laughs> so it's a bit of a kind of, you know, you just got to wait and hang around. So probably in December, I'd like to have most of my prize money. But, uh, you know, so uh, there's a bit of waiting period. So that's what the work is there for. And also for just my mental space, mate, just to, you know, keep me as, uh, as normal as possible. Now balancing his building with a daily training schedule, Walsh will build up for competition in the New Zealand summer before another Northern Hemisphere summer in his build up to Rio. The travel is something the man from Timaru is becoming accustomed to. Yeah, mate, missing out the winters. A few cold days here at the, you know, when I got back, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's a tough part of it, my life, mate. Summer to summer. <laughs> Gordon Findlater, CTV Sport. Time now for your region's weather forecast. Good evening, Canterbury. Well, today, mainly fine out there with light winds, and we did see some north easterlies really freshening up that afternoon. Today's highs for South Canterbury, 18 was the high for you, Timaru, and Twizel, you actually took out 22 degrees today. Pretty warm for you, Twizel. Central Canterbury, Christchurch on 16, and 15 was the high for Akaroa, Ashburton on 18, along with Methven and Darfield. Heading further north, Kaikoura, 16 degrees was your high, 17 for Cheviot, and a little bit warm for Amberley and Arana. On 18. 19 though for Colverton and Oxford. And over to the Alpine region. Sunshine for you guys as well today. 15 was the high though for Lake Tekapo and Mount Cook. Tomorrow we are expecting a really nice day. 23 degrees is your high Timaru with northwesterly winds coming through in the afternoon and 9 for a very mild overnight low. Ashburton could be a really good day to get outside on your lunch break if you can. 22 degrees for your high there and those northwesterly winds as well. 9 for your overnight low too. Christchurch, a beautiful day for Friday for the Garden City. 23 degrees there, taking out the region's high and those northerly winds. Kai Kaora, sunny for you too, but a little bit cooler on 19 degrees. Nothing to scoff at though. Eight for your morning low there and some light coastal winds coming your way. Northwesterly winds across the board, particularly for South Canterbury. 22 is the high there for Waimate and 21 for Tamuka and Geraldine. Central Canterbury, I'm just starting to sound like a parrot. It's sunshine here for you guys as well. Northwesterly winds for Leeston, Darfield and Methven. 22 degrees is your high at Leeston and Akaroa. Heading further north, blue skies for you guys. 20 degrees for Cheviot and Amberley and 21 for Rangiora, Oxford, Colverton and Henry Springs. Over to the Alpine region, you guessed it, sunshine here as well. North Westleys for Lake Tekapo and Mount Cook. Now the weekend, I bet you're all planning your weekend activities. We are seeing lovely sunshine, but a wee bit of a front coming through on Saturday, early afternoon with south westerly winds there. Could be bring a few showers, but hopefully remaining dry. Flipping over to Sunday, north westerlies could be quite blustery, particularly for inland places. Beautiful warm temperatures for Ashburton and Christchurch, 23 degrees for you guys, and Kaikoura, 22. The rest of the Canterbury region for Saturday, south westerly winds not showing their face until the afternoon, so quite nice in the morning. Watch that rain a little bit there for Arthur's Pass and Lake Tekapo. Now on Sunday, north westerly winds breezing through again could be quite strong. We are also seeing a southwesterly change in the evening on Sunday. Could we bring a few showers with it and again falls there for Arthur's Pass and Lake Tekapo. Tomorrow look forward to that really warm temperatures. As I said, maybe get outside if you can and get some vitamin D. On the weekend those fronts are coming through so maybe think about those when you're planning your activities. And that's your update for Thursday. And that's CTV News for Thursday. Have a great evening. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.